We did the whole why do we want Li-Fi bit earlier. So I'll try and not repeat that. And we'll go into the what's the standardization out there and what are some of the cons cause and consequences of, of what we're doing, yeah? So as a general approach, we'll look at some of the light communication standards. We'll then look at the relative positioning of those standards. Uh, I'll try and go through the high level description of the standards. We'll go through the ecosystem requirements and then we'll go into the questions, okay? So we have about half an hour, right? Yeah. So I'm gonna run through things so that we have more time to actually have a discussion, okay? And if we start digging into like the really detailed stuff, I'm just going to point you to references, just FYI, <laughs> okay? Um, so uh, in 2017, we looked at what was happening in the world of uh, light communication standardization, and we identified three different areas, right? The first thing that was happening was the ITUT G.VLC study group at the time. The next one was the 802.15.7 R1, which has now become the 15.7.2018. And the third one was the 802.15.13. At a very, very high level, I'll go through what they've done, but all of them had the same problem. You do not have the critical mass for an ecosystem that can create the market for the technology. That's your baseline problem statement, okay? Everything else technology-wise, it's fantastic, largely solved. Um, so we said, okay, where do we see the ecosystem mostly complete? We saw it in Dot 11, so that's the guys that do Wi-Fi and they also do Y-Gig. And said, okay, let's see if we can go there because they have the chipset vendors, they have the network infrastructure providers, they have the device integrators, and they have the end customers and operators that can drive your demand profile. So this was 2017. We then needed to justify, okay, why do we need yet another standard that does light communications? So you need to articulate what's the differentiating element. So largely, what you have is 15.7 uh, was a small thing that looked at specialty areas and relatively low data rates, right? Megabits per second, a couple of megabits per second. With the 15.7M, as it turned into, before turning into 2017-18. Actually, it was mostly focused on optical camera communications. So for, if anybody here has tried implementing the original 15.7 standard, you let me know how that went with you. We found a whole bunch of bugs and a whole bunch of holes that we could not plug. So we ended up scrapping it, and we created this thing called 15.13, which is a much smaller standard, but it's largely implementable, we think, okay? Um, and, but again, we understood the problems, right? So it was really designed for kind of specialty areas, relatively low volume, and you had a range of kind of complexity um, capabilities, but it did require some complexity to implement. But it was, it was never designed for the mass market. And looking at Dot 11, we said, okay, we're gonna use the Dot 11 Mac, because everybody knows and loves it. If you come into an organization to try and present technology to them, so our colleagues from Nokia will know, you will be faced with a person that buys the equipment, the person that uses the equipment, and the person that installs it. And they are never the same people. They're never the same people, yeah? So when you talk to the IT guys that want to manage it, if you tell them, yeah, it looks like Wi-Fi, they're very happy. They get instantly relaxed because everybody understands Wi-Fi, they know how to reboot it, they know how to get it up and running, and they're comfortable with it. If you talk to the users and you tell them it looks exactly like Wi-Fi, oh, okay, yeah, I get that. That's kind of an intuitive thing. And if you talk to the installers, oh, it's just a single cable, then they get kind of relaxed and it's relatively easier. So it makes it simpler for them to absorb what the technology can do for them. And that's, an, that's a critical part, right? Um, but we'll dig into that a bit later on. So this is kind of what the general picture looked like, and that's why we said, okay, we think we need a .11 variant for light communication. So let's look at the first ones. Um, ITUT G.VLC, they've got wavelength between 5,000 nanometers to 110 nanometers. Uh, data rates of about 2 gigabits per second, effectively 50, 100, and 200 megahertz channels. I think they're doing a revision now, uh, doing it parts of the Mac, but also possibly the Phi. It's really power line communications. Who here is familiar with power line communications? Okay, so power line communications have these like small modems that you stick into the power socket. You stick an ethernet cable into it, and on the other end, there's another modem, and out comes an ethernet cable to it. And then 
there's a whole bunch of stuff that happens, but effectively it turns your electrical wires into data carrying capacity. Okay, that's the general concept. It used to be a really big thing before Wi-Fi mesh killed it, but it's still there. I mean, it's still very useful in certain areas. Yeah, but that's what it's based on. So um, coax cablings. So if you have like cable modems at home, uh, home networking, those are largely the same chipsets. And they said, okay, we're going to use exactly the same chipset. And we're just going to say, okay, one option is to use the power lines. Another option is to use a coax modem. A third option is to use light. A fourth option is blah, blah, blah. So that light bit, that's what this is. So all of the Phi stuff, really great Phi, cutting edge, LDPC, all the good things that you could want, right? I think it's like 12 bits uh, that you can load onto it as a, you know, um, as a per symbol, I think adaptive bit power loading, all sorts of cutting edge tech, right? As far as FIs go, it's pretty much top of the range FI. Um, but you still have the underlying basis, which is a completely different protocol. It's not designed on, it's designed for multiple access to support up to about maximum of 16 users using a TDMA, FDMA style, depending on what you do. And there's no handover between them. So its use cases are kind of areas where you control both the device side and the access side. So if you can control the entire envelope, then it's easy to deploy it because this is your end device, this is your access point, and you're done. When you need interoperability with random multi-vendor support, people walking in, it becomes a little bit more complicated. Oh yeah, and they, they brought in something called, so when you do this power line modem for VLC, you end up with direct uh, current offset, uh, with direct current DC offset uh, optical OFDM, DCO OFDM. Who here has heard of that? Okay, this is the most common way of doing <laughs> visible light communication. That's your base phi, okay? Um, you can do on-off keying, which is the primitive way, you know, that has been done for years. Or you do this thing called DCO OFDM, where you have an OFDM signal, and you upshift it by a certain amount, and then you fill around the top, and you get rid of the, the imaginary part, which doesn't exist, okay? That's the baseline. There's new things called asymmetrically clipped OFDM, which kind of takes, okay, if this is my base level and I'm fluctuating around the middle, I base it lower, I cut the bottom half, and I flip it over. And you get, basically you sacrifice uh, spectral efficiency for energy, supposedly. What the exact benefits are is debatable because there's a whole bunch of system um, capabilities that end up playing into the energy efficiency argument, so it doesn't necessarily always work out as the most energy efficient one. Anyway, so... Then we look at 802.15.13. So this is slightly bigger data, uh, data rates, so about 10 gigabit per second, 10, nanometer, um, 10 micrometers out to about 190 um, nanometers. It, it's, again, designed for point-to-point -point and point-to-multipoint solutions, both a coordinated topology and a non-coordinated topology. That's where the discussion earlier was for the, those of you that were in the morning session about how can you have, you know, how do you handle multiple access? How do you ha handle the inherent hidden node problem and things like that? And you have some adaptive uh, adaptation for varying channel conditions. So core use cases are, again, enterprise, industrial wireless, but you can also use the same capability for backhauling, right? Whether I'm shooting this way or I change the optics and I shoot this way, it's pretty much the same technology. Um, so... It's got new wife, uh, it's got new FIs, there's adaptive bit power loading that was introduced, there's a pulse modulated FI, and there's this DCO OFDM FI, which is the basis of all of these things. Um, draft one is pretty much complete. We got a bunch of comments that we're going through the resolution. So I'm one of the vice chairs, by the way, of the 802.15.13 group. And uh, we have the pulse modulated FI, which has this 8B, 10B coding, but also Hadamard coded modulation, for those of you that know that. There's a low bandwidth phi, which is based on 802.11a, the most basic phi you can ever imagine, right? And then there's the high bandwidth phi, which is effectively a copy-paste of this G.9991 standard. It's pretty much copy-paste. It's got two sub-Macs, so once you connect to it, then you have kind of a choice of what Mac gets implemented. Uh, one is this coordinated, super complex, but really efficient Mac, and the other one is, again, based on a non-coordinate, which is 802.11a, PCF, so effectively it's polling. So what you do is you have a, you mimic a TDMA system by 
doing uh, poll-based scheduled access. Does that make sense? Okay, cool. So um, the issue is you don't really have a common wavelength, which is a kind of a problem. So you can have devices that anybody builds. You don't really have any way of making sure they're interoperable. There's no mandatory PHY. So you can build one PHY, I can build another PHY, and we can still be standards compliant, but the two devices can't actually interoperate. And there's things like that. But it's looking to complete for July 2020. And the general position in the group is, well, we'll let the market decide and we'll take it from there. So um, then we have 11BB which is the group that I chair within DOT 11. It's looking at 10 megabits up to five gigabit per second, license exempt communications. Uh, we're trying to complete in 2021. It's really targeted at low cost point, small form factor, low power, in essence, devices, yeah? Uh, it is really meant to create the framework, so establish a method that will take chipsets from Wi-Fi and make them as easily applicable to light as possible. That's what it comes down to, right? Um, draft D1.0.1 uh, is done. We've gone through some Phi proposals. There's a bit of Phi text to go in, but the next stage is the Mac where we have very relatively limited scope for changing things. The, to give you an idea, when you do things in 802.11, you have the whole working group, which has about 300 plus members. And when you start playing with things and changing things, everybody gets really upset. So before they let you do anything, you have a really nice discussion with the group and you say, I will change this line, this line, this subclause, that subclause, and it will be changed to this extent, this extent, and this extent. So you don't really just have the freedom to do whatever you want. Every five to seven years, they do completely new projects, which pretty much let everybody touch everything. So that was, you know, 11 uh, AC, now it's 11AX, or AX is finished, and the next one is 11BE. And there, everybody throws in all of these crazy ideas that have been sitting on a paper desk for like a decade. Let's bring those in, right? And that's kind of the free-for-all for everybody. But 11BB is not like that. 11BB is very much, give me a Phi and some strictly necessary changes on the Mac that will get um, the Li-Fi market up and going. So these are the changes to the Mac that you can introduce. All right. So um, what are we trying to do to motivate this? So this explains, generally speaking, what DCO of them or of DM works. So you have this output from your normal DSP. You introduce that DC shift. It goes through a front end. It gets detected by a photodiode. Then you have some sort of a high pass filter and it goes back. <coughs> Roughly, the big thing is no negative numbers and everything has to be real valued. So it turns out that there's a Easy, easy, easy way of doing that. No new phi is necessary. <laughs> um, so what you do is RF front ends anyway have this kind of baseband. And what they do is once they finish with the baseband, they just go up convert to a 2.4 gigahertz, 5 gigahertz, 6 gigahertz, whatever you want, center frequency. And then they downshift from that and they go back to baseband. So all we're saying, one of the big five proposals in, in DOT 11 is, well, let's upshift by my carrier frequency, which will be equal to the bandwidth over two. So if I have 100 megahertz bandwidth, my center frequency is going to be 50 megahertz, plus some delta that I need to get away from zero. And that getting away from zero resolves a bunch of issues around DC coupling, around sun, around fluorescent lights, around eye safety, Whatever, right? So that del delta is TVD, and one of the big topics actually for the March meeting is what exactly should this center frequency be given this body of constraints? But it's a really, really, really easy way of doing Wi-Fi in light. So um, what you do is, in, in this kind of context, by the way, is that this signal, this is an electrical signal, you can feed this directly into an LED or whatever, a TX driver. It's a relatively simple way of doing that. Of course, there are smart ways of implementing drivers, which have a relatively flat response, and there are easy ways of implementing drivers, which have a kind of low-pass characteristic of implementing them. That's where a lot of the cleverness comes in. What is the purpose of using uh, the same uh, physical layer of uh, Wi-Fi? Why is it good? 
basic bets, what's advantage, disadvantage? So the cost for a new chipset development is about $100 million. Who's going to build a brand new chipset? That's it. So the next thing is looking at a completely new FI, which is going to be, okay, let's assume that the market is there and that people are interested. Now they want to build specialized light communication optimized chipsets. So there's that option as well. And that option is effectively this G.991, but transposed into the Mac framework for dot eleven. And it's got this adaptive bit, bit power loading, which some people claim is really great. A bunch of people in Wi-Fi that have looked at that about a decade ago say it's not so great. I'm not an expert. We can let the, the guys that are experts decide whether it makes sense or not. But it's there as one of the proposals that's being moved forward. And so the general idea is that this dot .11 Mac that governs all, which is about 3,000 pages, give or take, is then going to have an existing PHY, which is going to be a common mode mandatory PHY. So if you want to be an 11BB device, thou shall use this PHY. Currently, it's 11A. That's agreed as the baseline because all Wi-Fi chipsets ever made and that will ever be made have Wi-Fi 11A baked into them from a PHY level. Not necessarily all the Mac consequences of it, but from a PHY level, they have that. And then you're going to have this LC optimized FI. So you use, the, you use the common mode to negotiate, exchange some primitive information. Maybe that's all you need, right? If you're just talking about some simple use cases like a few bits of data here or there for signaling, you don't really need anything complex. But once you've done this negotiation, then you can, the chipset can identify and can articulate its capability package, right? It's, it's a capability framework that you exchange between the two devices. And you say, I can support functions A, B, C, F, and the other says, I can support A, B, C, E, F, and you agree what subset you, you choose to use. But this is a way of, of getting to basically a standard that is really a standard with a common wavelength, common mandatory phi, and chipsets that can be readily, if not purpose-built, but can be readily transitioned into light. Another question is, so how do you end the picture then if you just use the same uh, physical, area, physical area of Wi-Fi? So we they all understand that the, the, his own way to, to solve flicker. Uh, Sorry, what do you mean by you can't solve flicker? No, I mean, compensate uh, the flicker in, uh, in the way you actually build uh, the bits. There's no need. It's a DCO OFDM phi. You just center it at like, I don't know, pick a number, 13 megahertz or something like that with a 20 megahertz bandwidth. By the time flicker becomes anything of interest, those two megahertz are anyway burnt in the beginning, so you don't care about those, and you just focus on the focus. Yeah, 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 okay. right, yeah. Okay. Yeah, there's no flicker, like we've, we've, we've tested that. It's no, there's no practical implications on the illumination perspective. Okay, that was a problem with the other standard because it was much lower data rate, yeah. Yeah, correct, okay. especially if you want to be, if you have low data rate and you're close to DC, it's a big problem. But if you have high data rate and you're away from DC, doesn't matter. So, how does that look like? That's how that looks like. So what you have is, when you get a Wi-Fi module, it typically has this kind of dot .11 baseband, and it's got this RFIC, which does the up and down conversion across whatever spectrum bands you want. It's got these I and Q samples that feed into the RFIC. This is a stupidly simplified variant of what's actually out there, okay? There are entire PhD theses that have been written to break down what are the actual functional component uh, blocks of this thing. Just functional, not actually how it looks like. Just the general functional blocks. There are multiple theses of how this looks like. So don't mistake, these are not two lines. These are two lines from an abstract level. In fact, there's anywhere between 12 to 18 different signaling lines between these two chips. So you're not breaking this decoupling. There's only a handful of companies, right, that actually built these Wi-Fi modules that know what this looks like. And that's Qualcomm, Broadcom, Intel, High Silicon, Max Linear, MediaTek, and maybe a couple of others here or there that I'm not familiar that are smaller companies. But these two things, especially as you look at the higher end and newer technologies, stupidly difficult to actually break into. So if you do this, and if you assume it as a single block, the output, assume it's at 5 gigahertz. In fact, it can be whatever output you want. 
you can then pass it through an RF to baseband conversion, which is a duplexer plus some TX and RX mixers, which give you this intermediate signal between 0 to X megahertz, backwards and forwards, and that then goes into your optical front end. The design of this optical front end is a topic for lots and lots and lots of research. How do you make it best? How do you make it most cost effective? How do you make it this, that, the other thing? Lots of different implementations, lots of different concepts around it. How you do it is your choice. But please, 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 do not confuse the limitations of a poorly designed optical front end for the inherent limitations of Li-Fi. Yeah? So, um, with this kind of RF conversion and optical front end, we can take pretty much any Wi-Fi chipsets and use them every day. How about the medium access that's built into it? Can, what are the, is there anything you need to kind of fix, look at? You don't need to listen before talk, for example, right? Yes, exactly. So this is the number one thing that needs to be looked at. When you do this, you need to be aware of what are the protocols. And that's why, in general, the, 11, the Dart 11A Mac, for example, which relies heavily on CDMA, not the best Mac. But all of the newer variants will have the listen before talk, and most importantly, 11AX, which is Wi-Fi 6, has OFDMA as a standard mandatory feature across all Wi-Fi 6 chipsets, which means you have scheduled access anyway. If you'll have to deal with a special configuration, if someone needs to disable CTS, RTS type of features, you know, to make that Mac to be in operational mode that you like in order not to be driven through all the inefficiencies? Um, so I don't necessarily know exactly the details of what you need to do. That's one of the things that we're doing over the next okay. few months in Dot 11 is identifying exactly what feature set needs to be on, off, or configured however it needs to be configured. But yes, there is going to be some sort of a trigger that comes in from a, the device that says, you know, an application layer, at the end of the day, the user or the device needs to sense and figure out, okay, I'm in a Li-Fi environment, I now want to receive using light, trigger my light antenna. And that trigger can push a config file or trigger a particular configuration that can, that can achieve. Very good question. So ideally, this eventually gets rolled into this. But for that to happen, you have to generate enough market demand that someone's going to be willing to burn five, 10, 15 million dollars to create an RFIC that will host that. But in the meantime, that's how it looks like. So I'm not going to talk about the optical front end because that's exactly where a lot of research goes into, into making these things good, efficient, cost effective, etc. But the RF down conversion and up conversion, this is how that looks like. You have a Wi-Fi, Li-Fi switch. And when you switch, you go to a simple up-down converter mixer, which is a circulator, and you go into a circulator with a PA enable, which then lets you do this. It's not that complicated. It takes a lot of work to build it well, to build it cost-effectively, to build it you know, integrated enough, yes. But there's a primitive proof of concept. Pretty much a master's level student with good electronic engineering experience should be able to build this circuit for you. How well it works is a different question, yeah? Chipset, no, no, right? you can put whatever chipset you want on here. It will work for... Yeah, but then uh, you don't have this LFDMA anymore. Correct. Again, what you want to achieve depends on the use case. If you want to achieve very simple device-to-device -device communications, like in the context of platooning, you don't need OFDMA. There's only one vehicle in front of me. Why do I need OFDMA for that scenario? Yeah? If I want to stream some primitive information across to an IoT node. I don't need OFDMA. If I want to serve 15 people sitting under a light, each with a different element, yes, you, you do. So it's, it's that balance. But because you're decoupling the front end with the back end, you get to connect whatever you think is best. Also, keep in mind that the price points for these chipsets have very different perspectives. And as a consequence, that limits their utility. So you won't see Wi-Fi 6 shipped in mid mid-range phone for the next two years. Its price has to come down. Its low-end phones are definitely not going to have it for the next two to three years. That's what it comes down to, right? It's all of these dynamics. So, um, 
what have we done? This is what we've done. I talked through a lot of this. Another important po point is that once you have the DOT 11 Mac, you have cross compatibility with all Wi-Fi management platforms, which means you have the ability to natively connect with 3GPP um, 4G, 5G network management frameworks. That was the discussion point that Stefan was talking about, right? Where do you break the line and where do you communicate? I told you guys in the beginning that your Wi-Fi, that your carriers, if they have Wi-Fi, they'll switch you between them. So they'll do identity management between Wi-Fi and 3GPP. Hugely important topic. There's an entire working group in 3GPP that does identity management. Non-trivial. But when you go with the Wi-Fi Mac, they know how to do that. And you have a whole bunch of other people that are working on that topic to make sure that it stays focused. So the vision of having Wi-Fi, Li-Fi, 3GPP from a radio access technology, all of them interoperating to serve a single customer becomes much simpler, which means you can do multiband operations with seamless RF to Li-Fi handover, and you have the complete end-to-end -end security that is upgraded as you progress. What are the open topics? Backhaul. Power over Ethernet is a good way of doing it. Power line communications could work. But there's a lot of dependency on what exactly is the electrical wiring, what exactly is the capacity, how much are you radiating, what other conflicts you're causing. Could you use RF? Internet of radio light, right? They're doing like millimeter wave into a luminaire, using it as backhaul. Could you use light? Could you be bouncing things off, you know, connecting them in mesh ways? What's the best from a cost, energy, and spectrum perspective for deploying hundreds or, th or thousands of live IAPs? And none of this is in the standard, No. These are open topics. This is where you as researchers would add a lot of value if you could address these questions. So if we look at the ecosystem, and I'm going to run over time, but I think this is important. It all starts here, guys. No components, nothing. You need chipsets. You need sensors. You need camera modules. You need detectors. You need batteries, whatever. All of that gets then packaged into the integrators, which is mobile phones, or your access points, or your TVs, or your whatever, or your projectors, or your robots, or your whatever. That then goes through all of these certifications, right? Underwriter laboratories, for those of you that, know, that don't know UL, FCC for the Spectrum, <coughs> Wi-Fi Alliance, 3GPP, etc. There is a body that has to say that your product does what you claim it does. Nature of the world. This is what I said earlier. If someone wants to monetize it, well, just, they'll just say, okay, all Li-Fi equipment in the future has to run through this laboratory. Boom. Right? But this certification and testing step is not avoidable. Then the next is the distributors, which is telecom operators. When you buy your phone from Orange or whoever it is, shops, direct to the customers. That's the entire distribution network. And ultimately, us. Yeah? That's your flow. Technology doesn't happen if these things don't change, and these things don't change unless us customers demand that. So if we look at just the Wi-Fi ecosystem, because this is what I'm most familiar with, there's this thing called the Wi-Fi Alliance. And in general, it has chipsets, infrastructure, and device integrators, and these guys largely form the board of the Wi-Fi Alliance. Then there's test houses, research organizations, telcos, and customers, etc that all contribute towards what is valuable and how do you move forward and what should the future of Wi-Fi look like and so on and so forth. So if Wi-Fi is going to be successful, we need something similar to this. It's never going to be the same because it's never the same capability set, but you need something similar. So what we've done is we've started something called the Light Communication Alliance, which is substantially the same ecosystem plus Wi-Fi vendors and lighting vendors because you need this vision of what is the technology, what is the value of it, how is it going to be used, where is it going to go. You need everybody to be on the same page about what's happening in this market, because if all of us are pulling in the same direction, we get there. If one person is saying, I think underwater communication is going to be the best use case, and another person is saying, I think Industry 4.0 is the best use case, and a third person is saying, oh, no, no, smartphones are there tomorrow, Everybody from the outside looks around and says, yeah, that's a bunch of people that have no idea what they're talking about. So you need this ecosystem coordination to actually deliver the vision. So what are we doing in the Light Communication Alliance? Um, I'm one of the chairs for the Light Communication Alliance. 
Our aim is to deliver the benefits of ubiquitous light communications to serve people technologies and far-reaching and coherent ecosystem, working at a determined pace. Um, aim is to drive a consistent and focused message to the end customers, and we try and do that by aligning leaders across industry and research to deliver the same message about what the technology is. And light communication is broader than Li-Fi. It's optical camera communications, it's visible light communications, it's Li-Fi, it's FSO. That's light communications. When people talk about light communications, sometimes they just think Li-Fi. That is wrong. There are, in exactly the same way when you say RF, there's Bluetooth, there's Wi-Fi, there's 3G, and all of them serve different purposes. Same thing. Different purposes for the technology, different use cases. Um, so I'm going to run over. Very briefly, I talked about this early optical camera communications. How do you use it? You use the front camera to pick up, you know, these particular unique identifiers of a light, and that tells you your location, where you are. A couple of colleagues talked about it. Um, what's the current structure? For the LCA, we have a board, which has about 20 directors. There's uh, regular plenary meetings. We have management working group, marketing working group, liaison working group, and a couple of executive committees. We are contribution driven. If you would like to join, please let me know. We would be happy to look at various applications from various people. I'll tell you right now, every application goes through a board review, and you need to fit the particular profile that the LCA is looking for. Not all applications get granted. But if you think you're interested, please let me know. Um, it's about 5,000 quid, 5,000 euros, which is not a lot, um, so money shouldn't be an issue. And this is our current, most current view of what we think are the near-term, mid-term, and long-term use cases. So today we know that optical camera <coughs> communication for location-based services and advertising is there. It's real. It's live. There are many small companies that are monetizing this, and it's a good business model. We also know that secure office spaces, defense of government, and RF hostile environments are also live today with multiple customers buying products from a variety of vendors out there. We think that advertising and geolocation services and industrial environments will be coming in the relatively speaking short terms, smart buildings, industry 4.0, and so on later on. Some people will be surprised that industry 4.0 has been listed as kind of a midterm opportunity. The number one reason is there are no products that are ready to be absorbed by a customer when it comes down to the certification, guys. And creating technologies that can be put into products that are on live machine lines today that are fully, fully, fully certified is hard. It's just hard. There are many <coughs> proof of concepts. There are many systems that are really well designed and built for that. But as far as we're aware, there are no current in-use production systems using this technology. And that's the only reason. From a technology perspective, this is done. It's available. It's the certification that we think will take probably another year and a half to two years before it's absorbed properly. And it, by the way, certification also comes in the form of cyber certification. Yeah? So that data flow isn't, isn't trivial. Um, and yeah, we think long term there's going to be a mass market solution. So again, thank you very much. That's our website. My name is Nikola Serafimovsky. Let me know if you have any questions. Thank you.